Uh, a very good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Social Justice and Social Security Committee. We have no apologies for today's meeting. Our first item of business for today is a, is a decision to take agenda items 3, 4 and 5 in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. Thank you. So our next uh, agenda item is the second evidence session on the Scottish Employment Injuries Advisory Council Bill, or SIAC Bill for short. This is a Members Bill which was introduced by Mark Griffin, the MSP, on the 8th of June 2023, and it is currently at Stage 1. The Bill would create a Scottish Employment Injuries Advisory Council to advise Scottish Ministers on employment injuries assistance. It is proposed that the Council would have three functions. To report on draft regulations for employment injuries assistance, replacing the Scottish Commission on Social Security role in this. To report to the Parliament and Ministers on any matter relevant to employment injuries assistance and to carry out commission or support research into any matter relevant to employment injuries assistance. And I welcome our panel for today's evidence session on the bill. Lucy Kenyon, non-executive director and past president at the Association of Occupational Health and Wellbeing Professionals, who is joining us online. Good morning. And Professor Ewan Macdonald, Chair of the Academic Forum for Work and Health, hosted by the Society of Occupational Medicine, who is joining us in the room. And so thank you very much, both of you, for accepting our invitation. A few points to mention about the format of the meeting before we start. Please wait until I or the member asking the question say your name before speaking. Don't feel you all have to answer every single question. And if you have nothing new to add to what's been said by others, then that's OK. Please allow our broadcasting colleagues a few seconds to turn your microphone on before you start to speak. And for Lucy online, you can indicate with an R in the chat box in Zoom if you wish to come in on any of the questions. And can I ask everyone to keep questions and answers as concise as possible. So I'm now going to invite members to ask questions in turn as agreed. So I'm going to invite Jeremy Balfour and thank you. Uh, thank you, Camina. Good morning and good morning to the panel. Thank you both for coming along um, today. Um, maybe a question for both of you. So I'll start with Professor MacDonald, if that's OK. Um, what involvement of any uh, do you have with the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council on matters related to industrial injuries disablement benefit? No, for no formal involvement. And informal? Well, I know most of the people on the committee, and it's quite relevant to the job I do. <coughs> okay, thank I was, you. I was asked to consider joining it, but I didn't join it because they have no infrastructure of support for research, and they all do their research in their own time in the evenings, and they're not even got a sort of IT base for what they do, is my understanding. <coughs> That's helpful. Um, I, I, I don't know whether, Lucy, you want to come in and answer as well, please. Uh, yes, I, I would. I don't have as much detailed knowledge as you and around the um, the scientific um, interest, but certainly I know that having had conversations with uh, the Manchester University team and formerly with Birmingham University in terms of investigating uh, industrial um, diseases, particularly, which is my expertise, but also, um, uh, sorry, this is my first time speaking. Um, just grab my breath. Um, the reporting, so looking at the reporting structures and how we can make sure that diseases that could be occupationally related are reported in through Thor and Epiderm. Certainly, I know that there's an awful lot of work that there doesn't seem to be a formal structure yet through which we can encourage reporting and early symptom reporting actually to prevent occupational disease, which is something I think is really important. Thank you very much. That shouldn't be very helpful. Thank you, Camilla. 
Okay, thank you. I'm now going to invite Ros McCollin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and, and welcome both. Um, I, I'm going to ask both of you this question, and it's very informative based on the answer you've just given. If I could start with yourself, um, Lucy, if that's all right. Um, <laughs> Obviously, given uh, the, the uh, answer you've, you've just uh, given to us um, and taking into consideration that there's no proactive way of looking at this, um, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council recommends which conditions and occupations are included um, in the prescribed list for industrial injuries, which we've already alluded to. So, in your experience, does this have any wider influences on the extent of which employees are supported or any preventative measures that are put in place in the workforce? Uh, at present, in my in my experience, I'm an independent. I have an independent practice. I look after small and medium-sized employers, and so, in my um, very very small practice, I have two people who I have referred through um, the uh, Gord's network, which is the Occupational Respiratory Disease Service, um, who actually, as a result of not having that kind of awareness of in of occupational diseases came to me at quite a late stage and then we were playing catch up on the diagnostic process i did anticipate this question and what i would like to do is actually go away and then formally respond to you in writing so that i can give some specific information backed up by some evidence by the evidence base but my, I do have a concern around the ability to actually protect, prevent and identify occupational disease. We also have a very, very lack of occupational physicians uh, and that obviously impacts the diagnostic, the opportunity to diagnose people with diseases and GPs and respiratory consultants in particular, although we have the Gord's network, don't appear when I have correspondence with them to have the uh, awareness or to exclude occupational disease as a possible cause for the symptoms that their patients are presenting with. Um, yes, thank you. And, and I think any evidence that, w that comes in, obviously, will look at relevance and, and what have you. So that would be fantastic. And I don't think we would have any problem um, if you wanted to do that. Um, thank you very much indeed. Um, Professor MacDonald, um, I know you said you don't have any formal um, arrangement, yeah. but uh, in your experience, would you be able yeah. to give it? Uh, well, I'm a answer? clinician and an occupational physician, Professor of Occupational Medicine, so I still see workers. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, uh, and I do research on workers. Uh, and workers' health. I agree entirely with what Lucy has said in terms of um, uh, the lack of the lack of provision. Um, I don't want to talk too long, but I can talk for hours on this, so you can <laughs> shut me up. But to put things in perspective, we just I share the Scottish Occupational Health Action Group because there is UK UK generally in Scotland as well. Um, it's probably got the lowest coverage of occupational health services to the workforce of any developed nation. For instance, Finland, same size as us, has about 90% coverage. So all workers get access to occupational health and the kind of environmental services that Lucy uh, represents. So there's a big lack of, of uh, occupational health provision anyway. And then you have this gap. The medical students get almost no training in, in health and work. And, and, and the NHS is very burdened, and they're all thinking disease, but they're not thinking so. In terms of, yes, referring people to, to this, I will not infrequently see people with hand arm vibration syndrome or carpal tunnel syndrome or asbestos or other dust related disease of the lungs or uh, the whole variety of occupational. Uh, conditions and we will advise them to apply um, uh, so that is there's an un fundamental underlying thing now just in context um, earlier this month I sent uh, we sent the Scottish Occupational Action Group sent uh, the First Minister a proposal for um, a Scottish occupational health uh, provision service provision that's because in, informally in London there's been discussions with DWP and Treasury about, uh, about um, growing occupational health because there's an awareness of it, particularly with lots of people falling out of work and a very large um, non-participating uh, ageing population who've got work potential. 
And they were talking informally about 300 million. Um, so, so this is a hearsay, of course, mm -hmm. but the point is that I don't know if the autumn statement has come out yet, but there's, there may be something in the autumn statement. If so, there may be some resources here for you know, at last correcting this wrong um, of uh, the lack of coverage of working people, lack of support to working people. So, anticipating that, we have we've, we've, we've proposed a centre paper to the First Minister, and it is now being discussed by the various civil servants, um, so that there is a plan in place to do something. But, you know, you can have plans in place to do anything. I have been trying to do that for most of my life. It is hard to make them happen. So, so there is a lack of a lack of. So we do see it. Occupational traditions do see it. There's there's probably about 35 to 40 percent of the workforce may have some access to occupational health, mm -hmm. which is a multidisciplinary, a very much a multidisciplinary thing. So that might include safety professionals, occupational hygiene professionals, nurse, occupational health nurses. Um, but there's there's a lack of there's a lack there's generally a lack of all of these. Okay. Uh, Part of the problem was when NHS was established, occupational health wasn't included because industrial health didn't really wasn't really well established then, and so occupational health is not provided as part of the NHS and never has been. It's provided by the NHS to its own staff, it's provided to civil servants like yourself, and to public sector and big uh, big employers um, will. Will contract for it to uh, private private occupational health companies. So, the inverse care law applies here. The people that get occupational health are probably the people that least need it. Not suggesting that you don't need occupational health. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, sorry, that was a, a very interesting and a very full and, and informed answer. And certainly, both answers I think very much focused on the support, um, but pre preventative measures. If I could have a, maybe a brief answer on your opinion, uh, both of you, on preventative measures that are being taken uh, uh, taking place um, in in the workplace. And again, if I could well, we'll do the other way around this time, uh, Professor Macdonald, and then. Lucy, but just a brief answer, if we could, because I'll yeah, get well, sh shot in a minute. <laughs> the, the, HSE, the HSE, of course, is aware of work-related ill health, mm -hmm. and the, the basic the, the basic health and safety laws, which, which you're familiar about, the assessment of risk and the control of risk, is, the, is the, essentially the control measure which applies to all working uh, working employed people. So that's that's what it, that that's where some kind of control measure comes in. Mm -hmm. But just to touch on something that Lucy said earlier on, there's not enough. Um, so th the whole system is reactive. We wait till you've got disease, and then you'll pre present to a DWP or whatever committee it will be, um, and and they make a decision about whether people get benefit or not. We need a much more proactive system in Scotland, which has actually got an observatory looking at what's happening, if there's any changing trends, and I can speak more about that uh, as well. Thank you very much indeed. And very briefly, Lucy, if you could just, on the preventative side. Yeah, Marie's just reminded me that messages I put in the chat aren't on the record. So I just want to say that 55% of UK workers don't have access to occupational health services. Um, I've personally picked up a late stage hand arm vibration case that had never been picked up through any of their previous employers. Um, and um, the NHS has one occupational disease service, which is the uh, GORD service, which I have put, run by Health and Safety Laboratory uh, across five universities. Um, I think what's, again, what's really important is that we know that in 2021 to 2022, 1.8 million workers were reported as suffering from work-related ill health, but only 17,000 made applications to the industrial injuries disease benefits. Um, so I think that's probably, the in, in a nutshell, we know that we're not getting sufficient applications to actually inform and push this further up the agenda because the, the, the financial burden isn't there, I would say. And I do think this is an opportunity for Scotland to really herald the way. Um, Aberdeen and Edinburgh, you've got a track record in Scotland of 
good universities in terms of occupational health um, with the University of West of Scotland, Aberdeen, Edinburgh and Robert Gordon. So I think there's there's massive potential here to get this right and to plug the gap and dovetail in with what the rest of the UK is doing with the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council. So I think there's a massive opportunity here. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Kavina. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, that was very helpful and really interesting as well. So. Could I just make a compliment? I, uh, Lucy unfortunately missed out the University of Glasgow, which is the only clinical occupational academic group in Scotland. And, uh, in this topic, and, and the only there. clinical group in the UK. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. I'm now going to invite Bob Doris. Thanks. Thank Professor MacDonald and Anton Muscatelli texting them there just to prompt him to, rem to remind him to put that on the record. That, that, that's very helpful for completeness. Uh, can I say good morning to, to both witnesses? Uh, um, so, SEAC has proposed is to investigate and review emerging employment hazards which result in disease or injury. Uh, that may duplicate activities of other organisations. I think Professor MacDonald helpfully mentioned the Health and Safety Executive. I think it's actually imperative that they're at this committee, given evidence, given their crucial role, as far as I'm concerned. Um, surely to goodness this should be their bread and butter, and that as imperfect as occupational health may or may not be uh, in Scotland or across the UK, the data you're getting should be used to inform the work of the health and safety executive. Mm -hmm. So I suppose my question is, irrespective of whether it's IAC or whether it's a SEAC, we'll have acronyms in this place, don't we? Mm -hmm. Whoever the advisory board or council is, um, the information that occupational health gets in the workplaces is vital. It has to drive action. I'm conscious employment was reserved, and the health and safety executive have a direct remit here. So, is there the possibility that there could be duplication when SEAC comes into it comes into place? And if you can say anything about the role of yourselves and how you feel you should be using the, the vital data yeah. that you would like to see collected to drive the change that you want to see. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps we should take um, Lucy King in first in relation to that. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think in a nutshell, the Industrial Injuries Advisory Council reports themselves. So research is done, as Ewan said, in people's spare time, but the reports are there and the data is robust. And then that doesn't seem to translate into a review. So I went last night, actually, because I thought I'd go and do a very last minute review of what is on the industrial industry in the, the IIAC prescribed diseases list. And it doesn't reflect the reports that have been raised since 2017. And so I think the in terms of duplication, I think it's unlikely because there is a gap in there's a there's a needs gap there in terms of converting the evidence, particularly in relation to pilots and air crew, for example, as one example, where that's the the actual resources not doesn't appear to be there to say what does that mean in terms of how we convert that to prescribed diseases and actually to have a rationale as to whether we do or we don't. Uh, that, Professor McDonald, see just before I take you in, can I just uh, get a slight follow up to, to Lucy's reply there, if, if that's OK. I, I, I have no reason to doubt anything that, that you say there, Lucy, but I'm just wondering if the day job of the Health and Safety Executive is to look at things like emerging evidence and patterns and work-related deaths, injuries and ill health. Are we legislating to fix the inadequacies of the Health and Safety Executive or are we legislating to complement an existing mechanism. Lucy. It, it, uh, can, can I get Lucy just to respond to that? I'm sorry, Professor. And then if you could answer both those questions, that would be really helpful. Okay. You'll have to remind me of which question. Uh, That's fine, of course. <coughs> People often say that. Uh, Lucy. Yeah, so I think it's to complement because I think, as you and alluded to earlier, what I call silo working. So I think the H Health and Safety Executive are indeed doing great work. They publish really good guidance, really robust guidance to do their best to help employers to protect people. And they do seem to respond to the research reports. What doesn't happen is that doesn't then translate into what happens for those people who become disabled as a result of a disease. And I think some of that is probably because diseases are fluctuating, they are slower in their 
um, onset and then their duration. Whereas an industrial injury, you've got an immediate injury, you can assess the extent of the injury and they've got an algorithm that they use to, uh, to, to work out what level of disability it is. And we can, to some degree, predict and prognose rehabilitation and recovery. And that is so much more difficult with disease. So I think probably what's happened is it's just tick the, the too difficult box. That, that's really, that's really helpful. Professor MacDonald, just to remind us whether there's any duplication potentially might be created with this legislation and perhaps whether or not the Health and Safety Executive if they've got a primary role that they're properly delivering in relation to work-related deaths in regional health that might also be covered by this legislation? I think there's, there's inevitably, inevitably some duplication, but it's not, there's not much. Because I think what, the culture of what Lucy does and what I do is to pick up things very early and prevent. Okay. When it's very early, they're, 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 it, it's generally not a breach of law issue. So the HSE is there. So, for example, with work-related diseases, if an employer thinks they've got somebody with a work-related disease, one of the employers who's got access to occupational health has been told you should think of reporting this under the Ridder regulations. That's the only way the, NH the HSE will hear about something like that. And it's estimated that only about 40% of these cases are actually reported to the HSE. Okay. Okay. So we need a system which is not just relying on the HSE because people don't always want to go to a policeman, you know, uh, yeah. and employers don't necessarily want to attract the attention of the HSE who comes in like a policeman. But the HSE has got a very valuable role. Um, what we've got to do is have a system which, which, will, which perhaps we, it allows us to raise the awareness, to pick up issues early. I mean, GPs and hospital consultants will, will never have heard of any of this legislation, the, the UK legislation, will never have heard of it. So we're a, we, need a, we need to be much moving much more up the prevention. The aim is to be preventing this system, to, to really prevent people. It's not just about let them get damaged and let them get money. That's, 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 that's a failure. That's a failure of the whole system. So we need to be moving up to, up to uh, prevention, and that can be done. And that means research. And that means having a mechanism to, to, to identify what is going on, which means you're not waiting till people have got dying mesothelioma. You know, you're picking up whether there's the exposures which might yep. be at high risk. Um, and so, so we need an entirely different approach. So it's not about just beating up the HSE, they, they do their job well. But employers, are, but employers are not particularly keen on voluntarily contacting the HSE to tell them about their possible problems. Yeah. Very, very yeah. helpful, Professor. Thank you. Well, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think Lucy wants back in. Yes, I just wanted to follow up with that, which, is, which brings me back to my first point, which is around the occupational disease reporting systems, which seem to have they haven't disappeared in but back in about 2017 i was talking with manchester university about how we could get the non-medical multidisciplinary team who actually see people at the early stages of symptoms because we're the ones who refer into the ewans of this world actually to get us to provide early reporting of symptoms so that we had a symptom reporting system as well as a disease reporting system and again I think that's something which isn't being done anywhere else and I think it's something which wouldn't be duplicating what is being done already and it very much then starts to come from the proactive side of things because as groups because we do all talk and you know our professional groups do collaborate. We can then look at that information, and we can support uh, the emerging diseases. Which, as we know, we've we've worked, we've now got good experience of working with emerging evidence because we did that very effectively during COVID in terms of our the turnaround of our health risk assessment for COVID nineteen and identifying vulnerable people who were at high risk of exposure. So I think we've got some really good learnings and I think there's a real opportunity here to fund the prevention, as Ewan said, of payouts 
for disease and to compensate people and to make sure that people don't fall into housing and food poverty as a result of a long-term disease that has been caused by work. I think I think that's where there is a gap and there is and there will be no duplication because it isn't being done at the moment. Thanks very much. Um, now I'm going to invite John Mason. Thank you. Hey, thanks. Professor MacDonald, you've twice mentioned research so far, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I think you're a little bit critical of the amount of budget or whatever that I, IAC mm -hmm. have, mm -hmm. and that they're having to do so much at, at night and mm -hmm. all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So, as I understand it, the bill proposes £30,000 per year as a research budget. Mm -hmm. And I'm new to this committee, I'm new to this subject, but it strikes me as a very low amount. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, it, 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 you can do very little research for 30,000 a year. It could employ, it involves employing staff, surveying, methodology, statistical analysis, and all of that sort of thing. Grossly inadequate. So um, the fact that money is there is positive, at least someone's thinking of it. But if I can just go back to one of my earlier comments about a proposal for Scotland to, in terms of occupational health provision. Part of that was that we do need, we do need, we've got quite a lot, of, as alluded to it, there's, there's quite a lot of, we all operate, we all link quite well, um, uh, and the academic groups all speak to each other. But we do need to try it. Because of the, the, free, the, the low number of experts that are around, we do need to make sure to harness them, to work together. So one of the proposals in that paper that's gone to, gone to um, uh, First Minister is that to create a, a Scottish centre for health and work. It would be a, it would be a, a semi-virtual one, you know, hub and spoke, just to, to link up what people do so you get a much more collaborative approach um, uh, and to harness what resources we have. Um, and part of the role of the study centre would be to be proact do, proactively doing research on work-related ill health. And did you have a budget for this proposed centre? Um, well, uh, the budget would be... Um, they haven't got a budget, but it, because only... The, because I was... A, on the basis of what, I, what we know, the gossip in Westminster which I've been part of. Um, <laughs> um, Chris Whitty, for example, is really on to this. Okay. Uh, no other CMO, because I'm a, on the Bevan Commission of Wales and Scotland, is really being proactive about it. So I'm not being critical of any individual. Um, so they're talking about 300 million for this whole area. And so That's at a UK level then? A UK level. Yes. So that would be 10% of that. It could be 30 million. If it, I'm a wishful optimist. Okay. I'm an irrational optimist. So, okay. but, but so, the 30 I mean, million wouldn't be for research. Yes. It would be for provision of services. Right. But within that, there needs to be a, a research, a place which is doing clinically focused research, which is using the existing resources that are around and, and getting some, and having an approach to do early right. monitoring. I mean, it strikes me we're looking at a few moving targets all at the same time here. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if, we, if we just focus That's on the... the way life is. Assuming your centre doesn't go ahead... Mm -hmm. your Not my centre, but well, you sorry, your the, centre. The, 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 you're going to create it. And, and, and assuming that research should be linked to the bill, then, um, what kind of budget, if 30,000 is not enough, could you put a figure on what should be there? I think for a centre um, to, to establish, for example, a people are just focused on monitoring and looking at all the sources of data, all right, and collating all the data sets and doing analysis, you're probably looking at, I think, two, two competent postdoc researchers, and that would be 100,000 a year. Each? No, that would be, for the overheads, you'd be at 50, then, so probably 150,000 a year. Right, OK, yeah. that's, that's, yeah. right, that's right. Um, thanks very much, that's helpful. Uh, Ms Kenyon, do you want to comment on any of that? I think in terms of an actual figure, it would probably be worth benchmarking with the University of Manchester budget for their occupational disease research. And, and can you give us a figure for I that? Don't know, I don't know exactly what that is. I was just having a look to see if I've got it in my in my notes, but I don't. But I can go away and uh, do some extra research on that. But I'm I, sure you and most of that than I am. I mean, uh, Marty Van Tongren is a professor there and he runs it. Yeah. So, and I was with them last week, so I can ask him. Well, I think that would be helpful if one of you could give us that figure. Yeah. Hey, 
that's great. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'm now going to invite uh, Marie McNair, who's joining us online. Thank you. Uh, thank you, convener, and good morning, panel. Um, I'll go back to the duplication. Um, Professor MacDonald, your written submissions um, state that a repeat of IAC in Scotland would duplicate resources and experts. What are your views on the view of SEAC undertaking investigation of the same issues as IAC? And I know you've covered uh, a bit of that already, but uh, if you could expand, that'd be great. Could you just... You're talking the duplication question. Uh, and I think, <clears throat> I don't think, what I'm talking about is not going to be duplication. It's going to be expanding. If we're going to do something different, we have to get better data, pick, it, pick things up earlier. That involves what we've been just talking about previously. And, and so we've got early detection systems. We also need to be more agile. I mean, <clears throat> COVID has been mentioned by Lucy. It's just, I'm just drifting a bit here, but it's relevant. Um, IAC has been reviewing COVID to see if there's an occup been occupational causation. <clears throat> In Glasgow, we published a study um, on, a, on the biobank which showed that uh, and, and, uh, <clears throat> to be regarded as occupational, there's got to be a twofold increased risk. Because a lot of the occupational conditions occur naturally anyway. You know, so you've got to, what, so how do you, you have to know people, are they, have they been doing the job, have they had the exposure, and have they got the disease, or potentially got the disease. NIAC will only give benefit if they're absolutely certain there's more than two times increased risk. Because there's a, that, that's their criteria. Um, for example, with, with COVID, with COVID, and our paper showed that, that uh, some healthcare workers, particularly medical support workers, had a sevenfold increased risk in the early days. Um, but IAC are still, are still equivocating about whether, whether that's an extreme example for one small group. But there was a generally an increased risk in quite a lot of occupations. <coughs> and, but they still haven't decided and they haven't made a decision about, about for whom uh, COVID might be compensatable. So, so, <clears throat> so, so that's uh, maybe I've drifted off your point, but we do need, to, but we do need, the... but we do need, we do need to have that kind of proactive analysis going on all the time. Now, that research I talked about was funded by a research council, NIHR, or one of these found councils, and that would have, that research for that paper will have cost at least two hundred thousand pounds. So. Sure. My, my, my question specifically was, you know, on your views on the value of CIAC undertaking investigation on the same issues as IAC. So, uh, well, I mean, the law has been passed that you're going to have a CIAC, right? So, um, no, 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 not yet. That's why we're just taking evidence. Oh, really? Yep. Oh, really? Oh, really? I thought it was. A, I thought you'd you decided that. So, I think there is there is duplication. IAC has got a very good track record and some very good scientists. The, uh, on it, of whom some are based, at least one or two are based in Scotland. Um, so there is, there, it will be duplication. There will be duplication of the research, and that's wasteful, actually, um, because the same diseases are occurring internationally, and why we have to, to do everything ourselves. But that if we're going to move to a more slightly more proactive approach, which links to prevention, which we haven't talked about really, then we do need to have have the research, the research function to be picking work-related ill health when it's at its most subtle, much earlier. <coughs> now, some of that's picked up already by the by the the, the ONS by regular uh, workplace surveys, but that gives data, uh, but not much happens with it. Okay, thank you for that. The British Occupational um, Hygiene Society have said in the written, uh, written evidence that Scotland has differing workplace demographic and industrial heritage from the rest of the countries in the UK. I just wanted to know if you could give us some views on the extent that there are you know, Scot Scottish specific issues in, in the type and instance of industrial disease. I'll go to Lucy on that one. I think, sorry, Lucy, I think you were going to come in on the last question, so maybe you could 
Yeah, so if I quickly respond to the last question, um, so the HSE have a list of stakeholders of which on their website, which of which the I, IIAC is not one, but I think if SEIAC were indeed to become a formal stakeholder of HSE, I think that would be that that would be a good um, use of uh, sharing a, a good sharing of uh, information and reducing any potential overlap or duplication of activity. Um, and then in terms of the uh, specific Scottish uh, dem demographic that you were talking about, um, so the NHS data itself says that uh, musculoskeletal disorders, uh, particularly of the back and joints, are the single bi biggest cause of work absence in Scotland, with over a million people visiting their GP every year with a musculoskeletal disorder. So I thought that was, I, again, I haven't been able to drill down into the actual data to see how many of those million people are indeed work-related, but uh, musculoskeletal, again, in your earlier documents that in the original paper you did make reference to the fact that the IIAC is still appears to be very focused on male dominated industries and male dominated diseases and Ewan's mentioned carpal tunnel syndrome which of course predominantly affects women um but but the, in terms of the um, what we call golfers elbow, tennis elbow, um, some of some of the you know lay terms for the upper limb disorders. Predominantly, women work in the processing industries, and therefore those injuries, although they are mentioned in the um, IIAC, they do talk specifically about heavy industry as opposed. To, there's a there's a passing reference to processing, uh, but I'm not aware, and I've look, worked in food processing and a number of those industries. Uh, and I've never yet come across a, a case where the condition has, the upper limb disorder has actually, as I call them, has actually been referred in to the IIDB. So um, you've, all, you've also got the oil and gas, um, massive oil and gas industry and, and, and people working offshore um, and, and working underwater and seafarers. So I haven't done the background data into that, but you do have a very specific need in terms of, um, you know, your it's it's male dominated diseases that probably affect women, and we don't have that data. We don't have that information because it's not being captured, and a lot of people go to their GPs with these uh, conditions rather than seeing occupational health nurse and then a physician for a diagnosis. The diagnostics happen through the GP network. And whilst the dip Diploma in Occupational Medicine run by the Faculty of Occupational Medicine is absolutely brilliant, again, there's not enough GPs who have even the basic Faculty of Occupational Medicine training in uh, to, to be able to uh, identify or at least eliminate an occupational cause for somebody's disease. Okay, thanks very much. The, Sorry, Marie, did you want to come back in? It was just to, to let um, Professor MacDonald in briefly, obviously just the extent of the Scottish-specific issues. Um, if he wants to come in. If he doesn't, it's okay. Yeah, the, it's true. It's true that Scotland has a strong legacy of um, coal mining steel and all of these industrial revolution industries, which are sadly all declining. And in fact, we've got more high-tech companies now than than the former. But we've still got a legacy. We've still got people getting a new mesothelioma from exposure of 20, 30 years ago in the shipyards in the Clyde. There's an epidemic there, and and there's not much we could do about that. The treatment's getting slightly better. Um, so, so I think it's passing. I think Scotland is is a Scotland. Um, it's probably becoming more like the rest of the UK because of our decline in, in heavy industry. And the, the, po the points that Lucy said about the mental, musculoskeletal and mental health are the two biggest areas of ill health, causing sickness absence in across, across the UK. And the musculoskeletal, most of that's degenerative. Now, this is the problem. 
clinically, why you need good clinicians to know what they're talking about, is that you're all, not, not quite yet, but some of you are going to have arthritis eventually. In fact, you're all going to get arthritis oh. eventually. <laughs> and it may, but I don't think it's going to be called occupational just because you've got it by sitting too much in the Parliament office. And so, <laughs> so, so it's about discriminating between it's occupational or not occupational, and that's where... That's where you have to look at the epidemiology. Does the disease in question occur much more often in a certain occupational group? And that needs research. And that's not, not, that's not a sort of HSE function. They're just measuring the cases coming into the police station, if you like. They're not out there looking at what's happening in the general population. So you do need both systems. Okay. I'll just come back in. What is quite concerning as well is, um, you know, mesothelioma linked to, to the building, built environment. Obviously, certainly in my area of, of Clybank, the, you know, there's folk as young as 30 have been diagnosed with mesothelioma. Can I have your views on that, you know, obviously going forward? Yeah. <clears throat> well, that's... that's uh, there still are... There's, mesothelioma... The epidemic, but still, it's been a bit of an epidemic and it's starting to, to reduce. But there's two factors in a young person getting it. One is you've got, if you're walking around the streets of Glasgow, you're, uh, all of you actually will have some asbestos bodies in your lungs because asbestos contamination is in the general environment in urban areas. Okay, that's the first thing. One paper suggested that 6%, 6 of all lung cancers were in fact due to neighbourhood asbestos exposure. Now, it's a paper done 20, 20 odd years ago. So, so there's environmental, we're all exposed to low levels of environmental contamination, just in day-to-day -day life. And um, in, the, in the, the Clyde Bank situation, there's still some of that around. Um, the, it's very unusual for a 30-year-old person to get mesothelioma because the, because the gestation period, if you like, of the tumour is usually 20 to 40 <coughs> years. But, and that's what we're seeing. So people may be exposed 40 years ago. Now, one of the problems about the long time that it takes for things to develop is that you only pick that up if you're taking an occupational history. What job were you doing when you left school, etc.? If you go into the NHS, no one says, what job do you do? No one says, what job did you do, historically, unless it's an unusual condition with an interest, particular interest. But in occupational health, it's the first thing we ask. What's your job history? Because, and to, to link that historic exposure to current disease. So, so that's, that's a bit of a ramble, but it gives you maybe the picture that we, we need to be... Um, we need to get a system which is a bit more alert to issues that are arising, um, um, a bit more alert to recognition of occupational disease, of which there's still a lot. Um, and, and the aim of all of that is if you're picking things up early, then you start the preventive measures. And you can get the HSE to go in and do their policeman role and, and, uh, and also better provision of occupational health leads to better health outcomes too. Convener for indulgence. I think Lucy wants to come in, though. Yes, I just wanted to add to that in that one of the cases I was alluding to earlier was um, a similar case, but in the electronics industry. And I think uh, respiratory diseases linked to the fumes in the electronics industry, and that, that's obviously an emerging issue in Scotland as well, um, that the fumes that are used in circuit boards and the, and the creation of that where we are doing technologically advanced stuff in the UK rather than the high volume stuff that's been done elsewhere in the world. That again, that's that that's an emerging respiratory concern waiting to happen because of course people need to be able to breathe properly to be able to function. And I think coming back to the core purpose of the IIAC and the IIDB is that actually we're talking about people who are no longer able to function optimally and therefore are less likely to have good quality work, good quality health, and to be able to support our infrastructure moving in, you know, to becoming healthy uh, elderly people um, when we've got a society that requires old elderly people to be able to function for longer. Um, especially as we extend the retirement age. So, yeah, I echo everything. I think we're, we have the, we, we need to learn from the asbestos 
story. We need to learn so that we don't have emerging exposures that then become the next asbestos. Okay, thanks very much, Lucy. Um, I believe um, Katie Clark wants to come in, and then I'm going to invite Bob Doris back in. Thank, Thank you. you. And it really is to pick up on this issue of duplication again, um, because as a committee, we're obviously scrutinising this bill to set up a Scottish wide body. Um, the reason um, that we'd want to do that is that the status quo isn't good enough. We want to do something that's better than what's there already, obviously. And I think, Professor um, and, and, and Dr Kenyon, that you've outlined um, quite clearly that um, the, the scale of the problem in Scotland. So have you got any thoughts or pointers in terms of the recommendations this committee might make that protects, if you like, the expertise that's drawn on across the UK in mm. the current system that collaborates with that and enables us to build on that? Mm. I don't know if you've got any thoughts in terms mm -hmm. of what this committee might want to consider. Maybe go to the Professor. Yeah, well, I think it, putting my research hat on, research... Basically, you're relying on research to identify a causal relationship with, between a condition which you can occur commonly anyway or might be specifically occupational. For example, farmers have a ninefold increase of, of hip arthritis. All right? That was only discovered when we looked at occupation and arthritis. And suddenly farmers come up with hip arthritis. That's because they spend all their time on vibrating tractors, probably, and also doing very heavy manual work. So that's where you find there's a, there's a, there's a relationship between... But that takes research, and you're relying on published research generally, rather than anecdotal stuff. So you, so you need to be monitoring the health of the population. That's where you need a basic thing going on, looking at... Not only looking at what's presenting to GPs, looking at the GP data sets, Look at the various data sets you can be monitoring to see what's changing. Is there a rise in something, or is there something new happening? So, so in relation to the, to, so going back to, your, to the code of your question, if, it's, if, it's, if it's, studies are published, the first thing we all do is publish it, you know, because that's the whole purpose of that's the output of research. So it's very within the, the people that are focused in this area. You very quickly hear about something. You know, I'm I'm desperate trying to find some new disease that no one's ever discovered, so it can be called the McDonald's syndrome. You see, <laughs> that's the only way to get your name lasts forever. And so, like Parkinson's, you know. So, 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 so that so you, so the, that sharing of research in a UK-wide basis, which happens, it, it, it's very important. Because you don't want duplication of what they're maybe investigating. So you need, a, it's because it's a smallish community, we all know what each other is studying. And so that informal system helps. It. So if someone's an expert in, in respiratory, for example, cleaning fluids, but recently Manchester published on cleaning fluids. You know some of the cleaning fluids, the cleaners are cleaning this building? Well, they can cause skin problems and asthma. All right, and the data on that has been gathered by the Thor system. So I'm not suggesting we would replicate that, but the Thor system only gets gets input from people that participate in it. And Ninety percent of people don't participate. You know, if a busy doctor sees something, very few of them will think of the Thor system. So, but do we need? But so you need active survey techniques as well, surveying the population. And that gets you back to basic, basic. What happens in the workplace, where, for example, hygienists are measuring the environment, occupational physicians are doing, uh, and, and occupational health nurses are doing health surveillance, if you think there's a potential risk, to see, for example, if the lung functions of a particular group are lower than they should be. See what I mean? To pick up early, subtle things mm -hmm. before it becomes disease. Yeah. So that's a complicated answer, but the answer is yes, we should collaborate, yes, we should pool resources. But we, what we need here is to move, instead of reacting, someone's, all these people coming, making a claim, and reacting whether they get it or not, that we create a system which actually feeds prevention. Mm -hmm. So that means that's where the additional resource has to be. We want to stop people getting into damage by their work. That's what we're all about. Thank you, Kavira. I mean, that's maybe something we can look at as a committee, how the, the, the framing of the bill and whether that 
um, is framed in such a way that maximises collaboration and avoids duplication. Yeah. Okay. No, well, thanks very much, um, Katie. Um, uh, I believe Lucy would like to just come in on that. Um, yes, I'd just like to add to that that actually um, there are some pockets of symptom reporting that happen. Um, in the early 2000s, I was involved in one where we were looking at um, in-store bakeries, and then we discovered that actually some of the respiratory symptoms, the occupational asthma, was actually more happening more in the uh, people who were actually using the machines which sealed the bags that the freshly baked products went in. So that was that's an example of where we monitor symptoms and then we discover that there's a potential alternative source where conventional wisdom says we know occupational asthma bakers lung we know we've known about that for decades and i think the gap if you're looking at how does scotland spend its money to get meaningful information and to protect the public i would say that First of all, strengthening the requirement for employees to report symptoms, because the health surveillance model that Ewan's been talking about, that we, you know, that we have talked about, the HSE has taken a pragmatic approach, which is that health surveillance is carried out every year with a 13-month window. Um, but what happens is, of course, within that time, people get symptoms, and then they might have forgotten because the symptoms have ebbed away or their role changed slightly, and so that it doesn't get reported in that annual review. So requiring employees to report symptoms and then having a formal system for, for reporting symptoms. So effectively having something that works like Thor, but which captures symptoms early so that we can, can start to look at the trends. And I think this is where this was why I said about having an, the multidisciplinary team on whatever information group you have, because we are the people on the ground who are seeing symptoms as they are reported. And so therefore, if we have a symptom reporting system, employers will be less anxious about it because it's not right or so reporting of injuries, diseases and dangerous occurrences regulations. So it's not going to feel um, if I report that, then the HSC are going to come in and I'm already busy trying to get on doing what I'm doing. And, you know, my day job's busy enough. I, I, I haven't got time to deal with the consequences of that. And I am going to do my best to make sure that that doesn't happen again. You know, all that really goodwill that employers have. Employers really want to do a good job. They want to keep their people safe. But we're still relying on the census for symptom reporting. When I've done my research into what data do we have about occupational symptoms, about the actual functional impact and the impairment impact of occupational disease, it's being reported through other systems, but with a 10 year gap. So again, we've got recall problems in terms of the reliability of that data. And of course, we've also got personal perspective. So I guess, if I was spending the money, I would be wanting to spend the money on identifying the profile of symptoms, the extent of the symptoms, where those were, so I could look for hotspots and then have, have an impact on preventing occupational disease across Scotland in your context. But setting a setting an actual bench benchmark and best practice benchmark for the UK. OK, thanks, Lucy. I'm now going to bring in Bob Doris, and then after that, I believe Paul Kane would like to come in. Thank you. Um, thank you. This has been really helpful. I, I think um, there's an emerging picture of that. Um, there are structures in place, and the Health and Safety Executive has mentioned by Lucy there, but they may not be sufficient for the ambitions that the, the Professor, for example, said about the data we should be collecting. Mm -hmm. um, so there are systems in place. There does appear to be a weakness in the jobs that they, they should be doing. And it's whether this bill is presented to us as the way to plug that gap or is there other ways to plug that gap. And that's something we have to wrestle with as a, 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 as a committee. But what, what the bill is kind of silent about, and, and for some it's the elephant in the room, is whether or not this new SEAC advisory committee will ultimately at some point be making recommendations for getting the, the industrial injuries benefits when that's fully 
when that criteria is looked at again here in Scotland by the Scottish Government, or whether another body should do that. So my question is about the difference that SEAC might take in relation to those kind of things compared to IAC, because they are, of course, looking at the same evidence and the mm -hmm. same experts deciding whether there's a reasonable certainty, which I think is a very, a very general expression, reasonable certainty. So uh, um, I suppose that's a long way of saying, do you think that SEAC would necessarily take a different approach to IAC when deciding whether there was a... a I'm not talking about the data collection, Professor. Mm -hmm. uh, we're admitting there's a gap in that. More generally, if they're looking at the same data, would you expect SEAC or IAC to make, come to different conclusions of whether there was a reasonable certainty? I think it's possible, but not desirable, because generally this, these systems exist across Europe and around the world. And so, you know, to, if you start saying, well, we're going to call, um, you know, ingrowing toenail problems an occupational disease in Scotland and no one else thinks it has anything to do with occupation, then I think that that's bad science and bad policy. So, uh, and med uh, so uh, uh, that's a, ph a facetious example, but so I think yeah. there will be situations where, the, for example, it can be tailored. The, 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 the woman, the woman not appearing much in the, in the that needs to be addressed, because women are more than 50% of the workforce now and they're doing all sorts of jobs. That does need to be addressed, and so it's in these areas that rather than trying to dream up something else which is new and a bit questionable uh, as being... Going back to the bakers, right? The asthma, I'll give you... I'll just I'll illustrate this, baby. Back to the bakers' asthma. The first description of asthma in bakers was by a professor of medicine in Padua in Italy in 1715. He described bakers' asthma. Now, when you've had your morning roll this morning, some of which will have been done in a big place like Morton's, which will have occupational health, some of the, some of the, more, the rolls will have been baked in a wee bakery where there's no, no surveillance of, 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 of staff because there's no, there's no system to provide health surveillance. You know, someone may have still have been suffering from occup occup mild occupational asthma who's baking, is making your morning roll today in Scotland today. So it's more about, I think the more important area is not trying to make, to, to, to make there shouldn't be any differences of the science is good unless their science is wrong and our science is better. And then I would expect the EU countries, they've all got parallel systems. So, you know, if something's occupational, they have to have fairly consistent criteria. But it's the issue of what we're doing to prevent it. And at the moment, most of, most of the workforce in Scotland, particularly in the small organisations, which don't have the resources to go and bring in occupational health, because it's, it's, and it doesn't exist enough anyway, um, uh, there's still people being damaged, which is preventable. And that's really the more important issue. If we come up and find there's a new disease which might be called the McDonald's syndrome, which is definitely occupational and, and it's not been recognised anywhere else, well, that's great. That's great. We, can, we would recognise it, but it has to be in good evidence. Uh, Professor, can I just follow up briefly on that, Professor? Then, of course, Lucy. Quite, quite clearly, I'm of the time. Thank you. Um, so, uh, I, in fact, you know, I'll, I'll pass on it and bring Lucy in if she wants to say something. If we're going time constraints, we can always follow up late, later, Professor. Certainly, any time. Um, Happy to. Okay. Yeah. I suppose, listening to our conversation, do you need? an equivalent of the IIAC, or do you want something else? So is what you need different to what you want? That's what's coming across to me because you and I are of a, we're, we're coming from the same perspective, which is let's prevent occupational disease, let's prevent disability. We're not doing that well enough. By the time something gets to the IIDB, that means somebody is disabled. We don't want disability. The whole purpose of occupational health is to prevent disability. Um, we know that Ewan wants to do the research and my colleagues and I from the multidisciplinary team, what I call the non-medical multidisciplinary team, we refer into doctors for the diagnostics, but we're on the ground, we're seeing symptoms. We need more information, more guidance. We need 
clinical protocols and we need reporting protocols and we need to make sure that all our data is easily captured, which has to be possible in this day and age. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm now going to invite Paul O'Kane in. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, convener. Good morning to the panel. Um, I, I'm interested in um, the proposed membership. Um, of SEAC and just trying to understand uh, the witnesses' views on that. I mean, we've had a lot of submissions about who should be in, who shouldn't be in. Obviously, the bill sets out itself mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the balance between employees and employers mm -hmm. and, and the sort of expertise. But I wonder if I can maybe just broadly ask, um, in your view, is it the right mix or are, are, are things missing from the, the proposal within the bill? I can't admit, <clears throat> I was part of the earlier discussions on this um, when it, it, it was being discussed by DAC Beg, which I was on. Um, but I, I, haven't, I, can't, I, haven't, I haven't got my, I haven't in my head got the exact mix that's in the thing. I'd have to look at that again. So I can't really answer that. Maybe, Lucy Kenyon, I know that um, you had uh, in your submission spoken about um, the need to perhaps broaden uh, the scope. I mean, I wonder if you might want to comment on that. For me, the reason for broadening the scope is because I think you need to have member representation from the people who you want to actually do the detection. And those are the multidisciplinary team. So, yes, it absolutely needs to be an advisory council in the current model that you've pr proposed. But to be in a bit, but if the advisory council does not have the voice of or the ear of, actually, if you don't have the voice or the ear of the people doing the work, because as an occupational health professional, I carry out my job to the best of my ability, due diligence, I do my best to report, I do my best to share my findings amongst the community. But as Ewan said, neither you nor I have a direct line into the IIAC, even though we are taking this really evidence-based approach and we are, we've are we got our own, we're looking at our own data, we're looking at our own trends and we're advising our our customer employers, so employers are our clients, we're advising them on what to do to make sure that the rest of the workforce doesn't suffer when we see something happening early on with a, with a member of staff. So I, I suppose we absolutely need the scientists. We absolutely need to have a, so a feeding mechanism to actually present the information to the IIAC who will then review it. But if we don't have anybody who can explain what the context is for the information that's being provided by people like myself, then the IIAC will continue to do what they've always done because there isn't that mechanism for the clinicians on the ground to be able to feed in. Okay, um, thank you. I might just briefly, if possible. Um, so I, th I think Lisa Kenyon making an argument there for that formal role within um, the SEAC membership, but I wonder if more broadly is there an opportunity to widen the scope via people having or organisations having observer status, being able to share views and opinions, being able to share expertise. Um, so whilst I take the point you're making about having a formal uh, status, I think would you agree that there is opportunity beyond that? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you've just got two of our membership organisations here today, but you've referred to the British Occupational Hygiene Society. Um, we've also got the Faculty of Occupational Medicine who aren't represented here. Um, and We're we've got that. the World um, College of Occupational We've got um, physios and occupational therapists with their specialist sections as well, all of whom, yes, informal links where there is but where there is an opportunity to contribute and to reflect on what the SEIC, IAC do, absolutely essential. All of that, all of those multidisciplinary professional bodies who are involved in occupational health, delivering occupational health on the ground. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm now going to uh, bring in Jeremy, and I think that's the last question. Thanks. I uh, thank you. Um, I suppose we heard a bit of evidence last week in regard to obviously you need fairly technical and scientific, scientific expertise to be able to advise both these Scottish and UK bodies. Mm -hmm. Are there enough people out there to do that?
to give that advice? Yes. I say it slowly, because you, we're, 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 Scotland, we're thin in the ground, but we can, it's a multi I think we have enough people, but we, w we would not be replicating, if IAC has done some useful research and come up with very good evidence, because they've got top scientists there as well, um, then we wouldn't go and repeat that. Um, and we would, in Scotland there are, there are, between the various institutes, you know, the various, the various research areas, there, are, there is a nucleus of thing, but um, we, it is thin in the ground, it would, ha it would have to be properly organised and funded, and it would have to be re a background of research and people processing data to pick up things, to pick up early things. So the answer is yes, but we could do with a lot more people in occupational health generally and also in academic occupational health. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms Kenyon, I don't know if you want to come in on which one. I echo everything you and said. I don't think I could say it any better. Excellent. Well, well I will shut in. Thank you. Oh, thank you very much. And, and thank you to Lucy and... Sorry, mm. did, did you want to come in, Bob? Uh, yes, yeah, quite quickly. Sorry. Very... Uh, yeah, and it will be briefly, and I, I, I apologise. It's my understanding that, D, and sorry if I've got this wrong, DWP have said that experts that sit in IAC cannot also sit on any Scottish advisory board. I think that might be the situation. Do you have any views on that? I would compare that to NICE and SMC, mm -hmm. UK health approval, Scottish mm -hmm. health approval, mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. we actually have something called multi multiple technology appraisals where they do things jointly mm -hmm. from time to time. Mm -hmm. and there appears to be a, a kind of barrier there. So any, any thoughts in relation to that barrier? Maybe mm -hmm. very briefly, the convener really will give me a hard time. Professor MacDonald first. I think, I think um, the, there shouldn't be a barrier. Um, Scotland may be a separate country, but we're in the same island, speak the same language, and we all know each other. So if there's, we, should be, we should be feeding off each other. Okay, thank you. And very brief. Thank you. thank you very much, Professor. That was very brief. Uh, Lucy Kenyon. We have cross-border working within the UK, and therefore it's absolutely essential that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. So we absolutely need to be talking and coming to a joint decision. Okay, thank you. Which just echoes what you and said earlier as well. Thanks. Okay. Thank, thanks very much. Um, and I want to say thank you very much to our witnesses for taking part and sharing um, your expertise today. Um, we will obviously continue taking evidence on the bill next week as well. But I found it very interesting and very helpful, and I think all the members here have as well. So thank you once again. And that concludes our public business. We'll now move into private to consider the remaining items on the agenda.